Okay, so um, we're standing at the newest high tunnels that we've had built here at South Farm. Um, I just kind of want to point out a few things. Um, this is a 15 by 44 foot high tunnel, so 15 feet wide, 44 feet long. Um, these are very similar to the ones we were standing in earlier with the flowers and um, lettuce. I just want to point out a few things. I requested a few adjustments. So this is a Grow Appalachia high tunnel um, that they installed. They did great work and working with them, um, I made a few requests based off of our experience in the other high tunnel. So this door is all metal um, because the wooden doors, although they, they work just fine, over time they start to warp. And, you know, the shrinking and the swelling over time with moisture or lack of moisture, it becomes more and more difficult to open the door at certain time points in the year. So I asked for them to, to um, change out the door to metal. Another thing is all of this component here around the door frame, right, is metal, not wood. So our other ones are all made of wood. Um, and again, that's a shrinking and swelling issue, but also um, just the moisture, even though we were using treated wood, uh, the moisture over time, just the humidity in a high tunnel, um, any condensation that leaks from the inside, you can kind of see it's, it's uh, there's a lot of condensation in there. Um, that will affect the wood and it does begin to rot slowly. So there's definitely a cost um, difference there. And so that's something for each person to weigh, uh, whether you wanna pay for it up front with changing things out to metal, or you wanna pay for it later on when you have to replace your wood components, right? That's a, a long-term, short-term kind of comparison that each person needs to make for themselves. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm super happy with these tunnels. I think they've done a really good job. Um, something else for growers to keep in mind, and, and we planned this ahead of time, is putting down this weed mat. So this is actually under the tunnel. So before they put anything in, they put this weed mat down. And that helps us manage the weeds closest to the high tunnel. Um, so kind of connecting back to what Dr. Larson was saying about the green bridge and uh, pest populations, right? Uh, we really, so this is on the inside, there's about a foot of it on the inside as well. So we can manage the weeds right around the border, which is always the most challenging to stay on top of. So there's some few, a few things to keep in mind if you're considering putting in a new tunnel or a tunnel for the first time. Those are just some uh, components that I would recommend. Um, if we want to come a little closer, I'll talk about the inside. It is pretty warm in here, so um, I, I can be the only one sweating here. So a couple other components. Um, we also have an extra layer here right in the corner. So here's a thicker piece of plastic. It's not part of the end wall or the side wall that rolls up. So this is a great barrier for that, just that extra draft when it's windy or it's cold, that really helps keep the, the keep it warmer in the tunnel. So originally it didn't necessarily have that and we could see air, cold air coming through, especially this time of year, right? Or in April. And so I would definitely recommend that's not a big deal to add later. Um, but keep that in mind, that makes a big deal, keeping the tunnel nice and warm when you want it to be warm, right? Um, of course, the Gothic style roof, we always recommend that here in Kentucky because of um, our potential for snow. So there is the Quonset style, rounded style, those are still out there, but if you're putting in a new tunnel, definitely um, get a Gothic style roof. I'm pretty sure that's the only style that um, Grow Appalachia puts in these days. Um, so a couple other things. So you can see we've got a lot of weeds in here. This used to just be a field. Um, and so what we plan to do here is solarize. So we're gonna put plastic, clear plastic down, solarize it, kill the weeds. Um, this is probably not, it probably based off of what we've seen in our current tunnel, right? We can't do it now, but we will do that in the spring. Um, kill the weeds and then till, and, and um, that is our strategy for 
uh, managing what's in here to get get it become to become useful um, for cropping. Um, another thing to keep in mind, and I usually say this with um, most of my high tunnel talks, is that uh, depending on your equipment, right? So the door here is a little wider than it was in the on our previous tunnels, which I like. So being able to get your equipment in and out and not constantly bumping up against the doors is really important. So keep in mind the kind of equipment you wanna use. Um, how wide is it? How tall is it? Can you get it in the tunnel that you plan to, plan to install, right? A couple other pieces of uh, details. Uh, the four corners on these tunnels are concreted in. So they used quickcrete, not a, not a huge thing, right? Um, a few bags of quickcrete in each hole. It's windy here. You can hear it right outside. Um, it is windy on this site. And so we certainly want to keep things in place. And so that is something to keep in mind. Um, I definitely recommend um, concreting in at least the four main corners of your high tunnel. Question is, what's our plan for dealing with perennial weeds? That's um, a perennial issue. Um, so solarization, we hope, will at least knock them back and at least kill the seeds on the, you know, the, let's say two to six inches. But the moment we till, if we till, um, we will likely bring up more weed seeds. And so uh, for the most part, we have black weed mat that we will put down in here. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not usually a huge issue. We put the weed mat down and then put the crop in in the weed mat, we burn holes just where the crop is going. And so that really cuts down on a lot of the, the weed issues that we have. But the moment that weed mat comes up, the weeds are ready. So it's about managing them in between crops for the most part. Um, that is where the biggest issue or any place where there is a gap, any place where there is even a hint of sunlight, uh, that is where the weeds come up. And so even with the weed mat, it's physical, it's physical um, management of those weeds, really pulling them up and um, removing them from this space. That is how we manage it. High tunnels, uh, there's really no herbicide permitted in high tunnels. Um, and it, I think if the, even if there were, it's a tricky, tricky, it would be tricky to apply it because of the small space and the potential for drift even onto something you, you didn't intend for it to be on. So um, physical management of weeds is pretty much what we have with, with regard to high tunnel. So from a pesticide application standpoint, there is no difference. So Rick, Rick Besson addressed that earlier today um, from a, the KDA pesticide application or even perhaps the EPA, all the way up to the EPA, uh, high tunnel is a greenhouse. So if, your label says not allowed in a greenhouse, that also means not allowed in a high tunnel. The, the one thing I'd add to that is if it, the label is silent yes. on the greenhouse, you, can, you are allowed to use it uh, in the greenhouse. Yes, if it doesn't say anything about a greenhouse, which is what uh, Dr. Besson means by silent, then um, it is, you can apply it. And so always check the label, always check the label of your particular product. Um, and so keep that in mind. For herbicides, to my knowledge, uh, there, there may be, while well, crops are growing, no herbicides are permitted in a high tunnel. Uh, so from a, when I talk about high tunnels, I'm referring to a passively heated and cooled structure. So. It's hot in here right now because the sun is out, right? So it is a passive heating system. There is no heater in here. Um, cooling, if I were to raise and lower the, um, the sidewalls, if I were to raise and lower the sidewalls, that would cool it down, right? Um, again, passive, the wind would be cooling us down. The cold air would be cooling us down. A greenhouse is a much more controlled environment, active system um, where there's a heater, there's cooler, there's venting, right? And you get to set the temperature and it acts accordingly. A high tunnel, you can 
maybe get it into the targeted temperature range if the sun is out, but it may exceed that or it may not hit that. It's a much more passive system. And I think some people um, perhaps uh, get into high tunnel production without fully grasping that there's not full, it's not a controlled environment, it's a protected environment. And so keeping that in mind. From a cropping standpoint, um, if I say high tunnel, I'm, if someone just says somebody's in a high tunnel, I'm going to assume that they are in the soil. I will then ask for clarification because I know not everyone is um, thinking that same thing, but typically you're planting in the soil. You may have a soilless production system in a high tunnel that should be, you know, if you ask, if you're going for help and you're talk, talking to your county agent, you need to describe that, right? I had a high tunnel and then I switched from in soil to pots, right? So now I have a soilless media, right? That's a really important component because that's going to change all of the recommendations, right? From fertility to pests to disease, right? It's going to change everything. Um, but if you say you have a greenhouse, that is indicating some level of controlled environment, which we just don't really have with high tunnels. Um, it is a much looser, I would call it, man, you're managing the temperature, you're not controlling it. So uh, Dr. Goche, what would you recommend as far as if people are starting out, they're either, they've already just put their high tunnel in or they're going to put their high tunnel in, what kind of disease considerations should they think about? So the disease, uh, the disease problems that you have today are the result of something that was happening a year ago or last season. So in this particular area, we know the history. So the history of this site, um, at least in the adjacent field, we've had fusarium uh, fruit rods in our squashes. We've had, we know we have sclerotinia just, just to my right. Um, so there are there is a history of some soil-borne pathogens here. Uh, we know in the very, very next tunnel, we had a little bit of southern blight earlier uh, this fall. So knowing that history, I can say for sure that we've got some level of inoculum here. So we can either solarize, which is what, what we have chosen to do since we're so excited about our solarization results. So solarizing should, we should get some benefit there. Um, and, and soil borne pathogens are harder to manage. So there are some other options, but I, yeah, I think that solarization is gonna really be what we need. Um, so just knowing the history, that's very important. Um, and confirming what you have using your county extension agent, your plant disease diagnostic lab, particularly if you are a commercial grower, which most high tunnels are um, on, in a commercial uh, setting, but confirming what you have so that we can have those conversations about exactly what the life cycle is on those pathogens. Um, and earlier today, we talked about temperatures with sclerotinia. The fusarium is just the opposite. It likes it hot and wet. So depending on what you have, we can help you make those adjustments. And also we, we've been talking about pesticides a lot today. Uh, we're gonna put some links up for uh, two of our uh, pest management guides, one with the Southeast Vegetable Working Group and one uh, as we refer to it, ID36, which is Kentucky specific. It's a little bit more condensed. So um, either of those two guides, same information in a different format, um, assuring that you have the, the right products, you've had the right um, confirmation of disease and an insect or arthropod and uh, using appropriate products. And I'm sure um, Dr. Besson will back me, read the label. So when we make these guides, we give the best information we have at the time, um, but always reading the label to assure that you're using it properly. So you would possibly, if somebody buys a farm, maybe wait a year or two before installing uh, some infrastructure that may 
it would be good. And, right. um, you know, again, I'm, I'm really so excited about the solarization. Now I'm, I'm really seeing how high we can get temperature. So that right. may really be the golden ticket we're looking at here. Um, so if you're buying a new farm, it would be nice to see you um, just kind of get an idea of what's growing out there. And especially if you don't know what's going on as you see plants going down or stunting or dying to, to get those records, um, we'll help you. That's what we're here for. And and find out what the dynamics are on your farm so that you can have a plan. And that's always the key is knowing what's going on in advance so that you have a plan. Jonathan, do you have anything else to add from the pest standpoint? About new tunnels? About yeah, new tunnels. things to think about new tunnels. Is there is there a concern? Is there anything anyone can do? I think you just have to know what was there before. Sort of what Nicole was saying, Dr. Goche was saying before is whatever you were growing there before is going to the problems from that will persist into the tunnel uh depending on your strategy so if this had been tomatoes in the field and you put the tunnel in so you can grow them in there whatever was feeding on the tunnels before is now if they overwinter as a pupa in the soil or anything like that they're now housed within your tunnel ready to go probably earlier than their competitors in the field right would be they're anyway. happier they're probably. happier in there right. would you see that happen yeah, <laughs> I'm going to stand out here. My my Nordic blood uh, likes this temperature a little bit more. So yeah, I think it's just all about knowing the history of the site. What was there before you put the tunnel on it and uh, sort of read up on that if you can from the, the farm that you've bought or the area that you know, and then figure out what may be lurking beneath the soil waiting mm -hmm. to come up the next year. Right. So the question, the question is on cover crops in high tunnels, using them in the off season. I believe uh, Tim Woods in Ag Econ has done that. We have three fact sheets, not one, not two. We have three fact sheets on cover cropping in high tunnels. We can include that in the, in the list of <laughs> information you all are going to get bombarded with. Um, so I think really and truly it's about the growers market and whether or not they can make time for cover crops that ultimately in my you can absolutely cover crop in a high tunnel it's a great idea and it can be done but it's finding that time whether sometimes it's in the summer right sometimes there's a break in the summer where people don't find you know it's not necessary for them to be growing in the high tunnel and so they they have that um, six week period right in the summer, you would need about six weeks to grow a decent cover crop, depending on what it is. In the off season, there, there necessarily isn't an off season in the high tunnel, but um, in the fall to winter, you're gonna need about six months to potentially eight months to get a good cover crop going in a high tunnel. If you're choosing a something winter that will overwinter like cereal rye, right? You, plant it um, now, for instance, example, and let it come up and get some biomass um, going until uh, I think March. Um, mustards are an option. So uh, uh, in the cold crop, there are mustard cover crops, but just be aware that that is, you know, cold crops um, are in the vegetable family. And so you wouldn't want to use mustards if you're then going to follow with uh, brassica related um, hash crop like broccoli or cauliflower or something in your high tunnel. But those would come up pretty quickly. 